interpreters who are here helping. Thank you for everyone joining us. Um, it's a tough topic to discuss. Uh, so I appreciate you taking uh, time out of your Tuesday afternoon to come learn about this. Um, so I wanna just do a few things. First, an introduction. Michelle gave me a nice introduction, thank you. Um, I am a licensed mental health counselor. Um, I, again, I have my master's in community mental health with and focusing on adolescents, families, and children. And I've worked as an in-home therapist for many years and now I'm supervising that program, uh, Home Builders, that can be accessed through the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. So if you are working with any families currently who are involved with CPS um, and they need some in-home support from a therapist, you can think of us and that would be great. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some learning objectives today. Uh, I wanna give some education on incest and in particular sibling sexual abuse. Um, it's more common than I think people realize and it's also very challenging for a variety of reasons. Um, and so I'm hoping by the end of today, you'll have a better understanding of what sibling sexual abuse is, how it happens, and then also some tools that you can give to parents and children to manage distressing feelings um, as they're going through the process of healing and in their survivorship. And then I was hoping everyone could, you know, put a one word check in in the chat. How are you today? What are you, how are you feeling? How are things going? And I'll give you a couple, a minute or two to kind of put in a chat, a check in. Busy, surviving, yes. I mean, it's a lot right now, right? With uh, at least here in Washington, we've extended our stay at home kind of order because of the rising coronavirus cases. It's the holidays, um, people who have kids at home, <laughs> uh, they're homeschooling their children, most of us. So it's just a lot overwhelmed, lots of overwhelmed change. Optimistic, oh, that's so nice. Toasty is good. Pandemic fatigue, yes, absolutely. I am right there with you, tired. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for sharing, surviving the processes, yes. And so I wanna encourage you to take care of yourselves um, as we discuss some of these challenging topics, um, things can come up for us. It's challenging to do the work that we do. So please take good care of yourself, step away if you need to. We'll take a short break somewhere in the middle, just a stretch break, um, just so you're aware that that's happening. Okay, so let's get started. So I wanna go over some statistics. I think it's, uh, I like to do this because I think it's important for us. It gives us context to understand uh, what's happening. So one of the things that I think is surprising for probably a lot of people to learn is that children tend to be, uh, they're more likely victimized um, by a sibling in terms of sexual abuse than by an adult family member. So we're looking at 2.3% of children are experiencing sibling sexual abuse um, as opposed to 0.12% where it's going to be an adult uh, family member who is perpetrating sexual abuse on them. And so it's, it's just a more common thing uh, that happens than it is for adult um, child. Um, the average age of a juvenile sex offender is 15. So in my work, um, when I was doing in-home family work, and now I supervise that program, uh, we did see, you know, juveniles who were committing sex offenses and, you know, teenagers. Um, many registered sex offenders, people who go on to be registered sex offenders um, as an adult, they most of them are committing their first offense prior to the age of 18. So for folks who are going to um, be sexually perpetrating crimes against other people, um, usually that has its foothold in youth, in juveniles. One in eight juvenile offenders are under the age of 12. Yes, Tanya, the PowerPoint will be available to you guys. I know uh, Michelle had asked if she was gonna be able to send this out. That's totally fine. So I think she's doing that at the end. Jean, let me know if that's the case. Uh, so one in eight juvenile offenders are under the age of 12. So that's a significant number, right? Like that's, that is 
prepubescent children often who are perpetrating sexual offenses against others. And then 7%, and this is, I think, surprises people, but females and people who were born female, assigned female at birth, they do commit sex offenses. And 7% of juvenile sex offenses are committed by those individuals. Perpetrators early adolescence is the peak time for offending against younger children. That's generally when puberty is just starting. That's a peak time for, for um, children, really, who, if they're going to offend against um, younger children. And assigned female at birth individuals tend to perpetrate when younger. So they will engage in sexual offenses against um, other children at a younger age, whereas assigned male at birth um, tend to perpetrate when older. And so um, usually those folks are further into their adolescence. Okay. So family characteristics. One of the things when working with children that I talk a lot about is you're really working with the whole family. Um, even if it's the child survivor who's coming in to see you, they still return home to the family. And there's a lot of characteristics or things that can happen within a family unit um, that can make sexual abuse more likely to happen. So the point being that sexual abuse, particularly child sexual abuse, does not occur in isolation. Usually there are other things happening within the family. And so it's really important to know about those things since, you know, a child usually doesn't have a lot of agency um, to leave their home environment, to increase the safety in their home environment. And so it's important to think about what's going on for the parents, what's happening in the parents' lives. Because if we don't know what's happening in their lives, we may not be able to accurately address how to make the home safer and prevent sexual abuse from occurring. So families with sibling sexual abuse, they often have several areas of dysfunction. Um, oftentimes there's conflict in the home. That can be domestic violence and really formal elements of power and control, or it can be non-domestic violence conflict, you know, just your standard tension, constant tension. And then that's happening a lot right now, right? Um, in terms of with the pandemic and everyone's homeschooling at home. Um, in my line of work, we are seeing families just have more increased tension overall. Um, and so that can lead to conflict that isn't necessarily about power and control. It's just about what's going on in the world or what's going on in life. Um, sibling sexual abuse, often uh, there's a lack of supervision. Um, Oftentimes, you know, parents may not be around. Uh, older siblings are left in charge of younger siblings. No one's paying attention to um, what kinds of videos on YouTube uh, kids are watching, which I'm, I don't know if all of you know this, but recently within the last couple of years, um, YouTube has come under fire for within their algorithm linking um, standard kid videos in with videos that are grooming them. Um, so lack of supervision, um, sexualized environment. This could be a family where there's domestic violence um, that particularly focuses in, on um, sexual issues between the, between the parents. It could be um, parents being very familiar with sexualized topics or language. It could be um, siblings exposing each other to porn, those kinds of things in a sexualized environment. Um, child abuse and neglect, of course, you know, uh, if neglect supervision is a form of neglect, a lack of supervision, but also if there's other issues happening, if parents are behaving in abusive actions towards their children, if they have their own mental health, their own substance use issues, if they're engaging in neglect, whatever that looks like, that just makes those children more vulnerable to uh, be abused sexually. Substance use for either the parent or the child. Substance use again goes to both the lack of supervision and oftentimes there's just, you know, you're focused if someone is abusing substances, they're focused on the substance and not what's happening um, with the children. Um, so and that could, and so that's a parent substance abuse, but it also could be the child, right? If a teenager starts abusing substances, we see that, or I've heard that in my line of work, where um, folks will talk about when they were perpetrating 
um, sexual abuse against others that they would engage in substance use because it made it easier for them. So substance abuse in general is a, is a risk factor for sibling sexual abuse, whether it be the parental substance use or the child substance use. And then there's also um, kind of a standard age difference uh, between children who are, who are engaging in sexual um, abuse against their siblings. Uh, for one thing, there is, there is some natural sexual exploration that occurs between siblings of more similar ages. But when you start seeing ages between three and five years apart, um, that's a pretty significant developmental difference in children and also difference in understanding what's right or wrong, understanding personal boundaries. The average age of onset is 13, um, who is the perpetrator, and seven, who is the victim. So that's pretty standard. And, um, and that tends to be accurate with what I've seen out in the field working with families. Okay, so let's talk about some situations that can lead to, um, to sexual abuse. Much sexual abuse of children, um, aside from, you know, really methodical um, pedophilia, where um, a perpetrator is actively seeking uh, children, a lot of sexual abuse of children is opportunistic, right? Um, there's a child in the home, um, that child is vulnerable for one reason or another, um, and that makes it easier to perpetrate against them. So we had talked a little bit before about supervision. So parents or adults don't provide appropriate supervision, and that can be for a multitude of reasons. It can be because of an abusive or neglectful reason, or it can be, you know, there are families where parents have to work several jobs. Um, you know, people are coming and going. That can be a supervision issue. Another big thing that's happening, particularly within the last few years, is access to pornography. Children getting online and having access to um, pornography. And so the internet has increased both the access, it's easy to access pornographic images online, and um, some children end up acting those out on their siblings. Um, they don't know, particularly without the without the context that an adult could give them regarding sexual expression, healthy sexual behavior. Um, and this would go along again with supervision, right? Um, the internet has opened up a whole another area that parents have to actively supervise um, in the same way that you supervise the friends your kids are hanging out with, um, where they're spending their time. Those are things that parents should be doing also with the internet simply because um, there is the risk that children will act out things that they see online. So older siblings uh, left in charge or in a caretaking role, that's, and that's a really common thing, right? Like it's very common to, if you have a teenage child, um, to allow them to watch or babysit younger children. Um, but in particular, individuals who are assigned male at birth, you know, they're in that 15 year old 14 year old range and they're left in charge, um, that can increase uh, sibling sexual abuse if that's something that's going to happen in that family, right? And that's also just because of supervision. And then also because of the power differential. Um, when an older sibling is in charge, a parent will often say, okay, you have to listen to your older brother. You have to listen to your older sister and do what they say. And so it can be easier for a sibling to say, well, you know, you have to do what mom said I said you had to do. Um, so it's also that power differential. Sharing rooms, and that has been a common element in sibling sexual abuse cases that I have worked as a therapist, where for whatever reason, you know, um, rent is expensive, uh, a great number of children. Uh, for instance, I worked with a family that um, they had five people living in, a, I think, a 32 foot uh, fifth wheel. And so, you know, siblings were sharing beds. Um, and then that led to, uh, along with, it was a combination, right? Um, the more of these issues, the more likely that sibling sexual abuse can happen. But for instance, in this situation, um, these children were allowed to 
have free access of the internet. Um, and then also they were sharing beds simply for space. And so that's when the sexual abuse occurred. Um, so sharing rooms, particularly when you have wide uh, age ranges of children, you know, um, a 12 year old and a four year old sharing a bedroom might not be wise. Um, they will, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, well, we can't have siblings of the same gender sharing a bedroom. That's a risk for sibling sexual abuse. But I've found that it doesn't, it doesn't matter, or siblings of different genders, I'm sorry, siblings like a brother and a sister sharing a bedroom. Um, Thank you, that's a great question. AMAB stands for assigned male at birth. So a, a, a male child. So sharing rooms, so brothers and sisters, sometimes I'll hear people say brothers and sisters shouldn't share rooms, they're the risk of sexual abuse. But if a person is going to perpetrate sexual abuse upon a sibling, um, I, it doesn't necessarily matter the gender. Um, I've seen, and it, and it doesn't matter um, how they identify, how their sexuality, how they identify their sexuality, right? Just because a male is perpetrating on his younger brother doesn't mean that he even identifies as gay. Um, and so there's an erroneous belief that sharing rooms um, or that sharing rooms is okay as long as the genders are the same. Either way, if there's going to be um, someone perpetrating sexual abuse against their sibling, who they're sharing a room with doesn't matter. Anyone they share a room with is at risk. So then there's erroneous beliefs about sibling relationships, right? Um, I've heard parents say all sorts of things um, and not even in particular about sibling sexual abuse, but just about their ideas about who brothers and sisters should be to one another, that siblings are supposed to support each other, that siblings would never do things to harm each other, that, um, you know, siblings ultimately are family and have the same exact love for one another that a parent has for, for them. And those things just aren't true. Siblings can be very different people. They can have very different needs, very different development. And so there's a lot of erroneous ideas about what it means to be or to have a sibling. Another situation uh, that can lead to sibling sexual abuse is poor boundaries within the family. So this is, you know, this is, I touched on this a little bit, but for instance, privacy is a big deal, particularly um, as children are developing and getting older. Um, Perhaps this is a family where we're not encouraging only one person in the bathroom at a time, or it's, it's okay to walk around without clothing on or various states of dress, um, particularly when children are demonstrating that they may feel uncomfortable uh, with those kinds of things. Everyone has different values around um, states of clothing <laughs> in their home, but it, you really have to take a cue. Eventually, most children kind of feel weird about that, but um, if, you, if a parent is pushing the boundaries around those kinds of things, that can definitely set the stage for sibling sexual abuse. Um, poor boundaries may also just be the language that you're using, right? Like how we're talking about um, individuals and their bodies. Ineffective discipline and communication. Um, and that's just over everything, right? That's not in particular around um, sexual abuse. It's, uh, it's about consist in being inconsistent with your child so that they don't know what the boundaries are or they don't know that every time I do this, this is the consequence or the reward or this is the thing that's going to make my mom mad and this is the thing that's going to make my mom happy. So it's, it's essentially what we see when there is sibling sexual abuse is that um, there's often just parenting issues, right? Like the parents aren't effectively um, having their children be able to listen and follow directives. And then a sexualized home environment. Um, for instance, uh, one case I worked not all that long ago was where um, there was a child who, as a teenager, had started getting into some um, kind of some BDSM stuff online. And the, um, her mother was just very perplexed about that and could not understand how her daughter would be into that. She had never been exposed to anything. 
But this, uh, this teenager was able to identify that she actually was exposed to a lot of fighting um, between her mom and her mom's boyfriend over his demands for sex and her mom's um, resistance to sex. So there was coercion and a lot of violence and chaos in the home around um, the boyfriend not having his sexual demands met by her mom. And so that um, that impacted her. And so that would be considered a sexualized home environment. And that's a form of sexual abuse. So thank you, Michelle. So a sexualized home environment. And again, that's just the language that we use. Um, are children witnessing sexualized conflict or conflicts over sex between adults? Um, are they witnessing it in their sibling and their siblings romantic relationships? Those are all things that can lead to sibling sexual abuse. So let's talk a little bit about how it happens. Um, it doesn't just happen out of the blue, uh, much like um, instances where an adult perpetrator, someone who's a pedophile is seeking out children and grooms them. The same thing happens with siblings. Um, there is grooming, uh, whether it be the older sibling's gonna give them favors, they coerce them, um, threats, um, Oftentimes, yeah, there's just a power differential between younger and older siblings, and oftentimes younger siblings look up to older siblings. So it can be easier to, you know, coerce them. Don't you want to be cool like me or you? This is what teenagers do. You, you know, I'm trying to help you learn to be a teenager. Um, threats. If you, you know, if you say anything about this, then I'm going to tell dad that you did this. Um, favors, if you let me do this, then I will give you, you know, my next video game time. So there's grooming, there's a process over time that occurs that really enhances the power differential between the siblings. Um, younger siblings, they don't, they maybe don't know that this is not normal behavior. They may be, they, they oftentimes, children don't have any other experience in the world, usually, and particularly don't have any experience with other families um, and don't have the developmental uh, capacity to even apply a lot of meaning to that. So they may not know that how their sibling is grooming them um, is not normal. It's not typical. And what we also see is that um, child sexual abuse, particularly sibling sexual abuse, often occurs with other forms of sibling sexual abuse, um, whether that be emotional abuse, which includes put downs, name calling, um, excessive teasing, uh, whether that be physical abuse. Usually we see all the forms of abuse together, right? Physical abuse being intimidating, threatening, um, hitting. Um, and that there's also a lot of erroneous um, beliefs about siblings and sibling rivalry, sibling conflict. You know, um, a lot of parents may kind of brush it under the rug. Oh, they're brothers, brothers fight, boys will be boys. Um, oh, uh, the brother would never do this because he looks out for his sister. She, you know, then there's the erroneous belief of just girls don't perpetrate sexual abuse, right? So um, understanding that any sort of abuse between siblings, whether we're talking about sexual abuse or whether we're talking about, you know, siblings beating each other up, none of that is healthy and none of that is, is normal. Um, so also helping, um, helping parents understand that, 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 um, that siblings, it's not normal or healthy for siblings to put hands on each other, to threaten each other or anything like that. And so there's a lot of opportunities for parents to intervene when they see those things, right, um, immediately. Because they're probably not always gonna see the sexual abuse, right? But um, when there's physical abuse or when there's emotional abuse, parents will hear one sibling call the other sibling a name. They'll see one sibling um, punch another sibling. So with sibling sexual abuse, uh, disclosure is less frequent 
Um, it is more likely for a child to disclose sexual abuse by an adult than it is for them to disclose it by their sibling. And part of that is um, they live with the sibling, they often are sharing rooms with the sibling, so the threats, um, the coercion, the fear, and then also not knowing. Um, sibling sexual abuse is more frequent than other forms of sexual abuse of children. And it's again, a, it's part of it's just being um, opportunity. There's access. And parents often don't recognize the signs of child sexual abuse um, in the victim or abusive behave, uh, behavior in the perpetrator. They may not see that um, the name calling, the put downs, the hitting, the posturing, all of that stuff is a pattern of abuse that's designed to keep this child, the victim, um, in a place where they can be available to the perpetrator, essentially. So again, those erroneous sibling beliefs. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about parental reactions to sexual abuse. Um, so one of the things is, uh, one of the challenges I think that a lot of folks have, and I just want to put this out there, is that when, and I, and I see that there are people on from a variety of different states. In Washington state, I work um, closely with social workers for child protective services. Those are where we get all of our um, in-home family therapy cases from. And it's pretty typical that siblings um, continue living together. If, you know, if one sibling has perpetrated sexual abuse against another sibling, those siblings often still have to live together. The perpetrator may be removed, the younger child may be removed, but eventually the goal of the system is reunification. And so, um, there's a lot of complicated emotions for families that they have to live in and deal with because uh, the perpetrator and the victim are gonna continue to be together. And even if they don't continue living together, they're still family, right? They're still, that's still your sibling. So parents, uh, you know, just like with any other form of child sexual abuse, they're gonna have a lot of feelings. Um, it's not uncommon for parents who have experienced their own sexual abuse to then have a child who's experienced sexual abuse. And for that parent, um, their stuff to come up, their trauma to come up, their reactions to come up. Um, and so being um, thoughtful about that with parents, uh, just because, you know, it's a, it's a grief. It's a, you know, no parent wants this to happen to their child. Even a, a parent who is, um, highly incapacitated due to mental illness, um, due to substance use, due to a variety of issues. This is, this is one of those things that a, a parent generally would never want to happen to their child and feels pretty devastated uh, when it does. So guilt is a pretty common, a lot of grief reactions. So guilt is one, um, where, uh, where was I? Um, how did I allow this to happen? Um, Perhaps they saw elements of abuse and they, they kind of squashed down a voice in themselves. Uh, I should intervene. You know, perhaps they're repeating to themselves, you know, siblings will be siblings. Um, this is how they all are. So guilt is a common one. Denial is another common one. Um, and, and denial is one of, uh, one of the more harmful reactions that parents can have toward a child who's experienced sexual abuse, um, whether it's sibling or another adult who has sexually abused the child. Denial is a big one. Um, and denial is also pretty dangerous. Um, and it's dangerous because if a parent is denying that the abuse has happened between the siblings, it doesn't give the parent a lot of incentive to increase uh, the safety for the child victim. And also, honestly, the safety for the child perpetrator, because as we saw earlier, um, perpetrators of sexual abuse often kind of get their start with their siblings. Um, they're going to have a lifetime of issues. You know, they're going to wind up becoming a registered sex offender. They're going to wind up perpetrating against other children or other adults later on. They may wind up in the criminal justice system. So it's really safety for both the victim and the perpetrator. Um, even though, even though 
when we think perpetrator, we think, oh, what an awful person. Um, how could they do this? This is still a child. In the case of a sibling, um, this is often still a child. Uh, and so, you know, parents still are going to have feelings, be, you know, about that child. Um, and denial can be an easy way to go. This didn't happen. There's no way. The younger sibling always makes things up. Um, they can say a lot of things. And again, if you're convinced that it did not happen, it does not help uh, help you make things safer for everyone at home. Uh, worry. Worry for both the victim and the perpetrator. Worry for, uh, you know, how is this going to impact the child who was the victim? Um, now they're going to need help. Um, are they damaged forever? And then worry for the perpetrator. Uh, you know, what's gonna happen to this other child? How can I have these children living in ho at home together? Um, how do I keep my other kids safe? How do I ensure this child doesn't um, hurt anyone else? So there can be a lot of worry. Um, and there's also can be worry simply because, you know, child protective services may be involved and they're saying, okay, well, you need to get this, this child into this kind of counseling, you need to get this child into daycare. So there'll be a lot of worry about um, now additional financial issues that are occurring because this has happened in the family. Worry that Child Protective Services is, is involved um, and that is a, a fear producing uh, experience in and of itself. Um, worry for how how perhaps the other parent is going to respond. You know, it's not uncommon for parents to have different responses. One may feel more concerned or angry and one may feel less. So lots of worry. Um, disgust, because if that's a natural reaction, right, there's something very, very taboo about any sort of incest. And to think that one sibling perpetrated this against another is, it is, it is disgusting, right? Like sexual abuse is kind of, you know, particularly child sexual abuse, we have kind of a, um, a gut reaction to that. And so that can be really hard for a parent to have now a feeling of disgust about the child who has perpetrated. Um, anger, of course, helplessness, how do I make it better? You know, particularly if they're living together, particularly um, because we don't have a lot of treatment for child sexual abusers. We don't have a lot of treatment for perpetrators who are children. So what do we do with that child? And then how do we help the victim? You know, um, and then blame on outside factors. And this is kind of externalizing. This is, and this can also be kind of a risky when you observe parents um, putting a lot of blame of, on outside factors, it can be a clue that they're in a little bit of denial, in denial that they have anything to do with how this came to be. Um, so stress, job loss, financial concerns, maybe there's fighting, um, you know, any sort of outside factor. Um, and the reality is, is that we're always gonna have stress. There's all, you know, for most people, there's always gonna be financial concerns, all of those things. And we still have to keep an environment safe enough so that um, children are safe and not being abused. I think, let's see. So increasing safety for kids. And this can be a really challenging, um, challenging thing to do for parents because of there's, there may be financial issues. Um, oftentimes people don't like to change uh, how their house is set up. So, so that's kind of just a practical concern, right? Like you may be asking people or, um, you know, promoting changing bedrooms or things like that. Um, so that can be really challenging. And this is another area where we're working with parents. Like how do we make the home safe enough? Because the reality is, particularly for kids who are gonna be living together, which has been a lot of what I have seen, there just isn't um, foster placement for children who are abusing sexually against their siblings for several reasons. Um, one is that that you know the goal of the system is reunification. The second is that there isn't a lot of behaviorally specific um, interventions for perpetrators of sexual crimes against their siblings. Like there is not a lot of group homes or residential treatment programs for that. Um, so there's a lot of different reasons why those siblings are going to 
be still living together. And so that's why it's important to work with parents about how are we increasing the safety for the victim and also again, safety for the perpetrator because they are still a child and they are their behaviors are gonna to lead to some pretty severe consequences. So increasing safety. Um, one of the things that we often talk about is locks um, or alarms, you know, putting locks on bedrooms in the bathroom, um, a door chime, you know, sibling sexual abuse uh, often is occurring at night, right? Like between siblings who are sharing bedrooms or siblings who have access to each other's bedrooms. So um, a loud alarm can help wake up the parent. Um, baby monitors are another thing. So, so and, and it also, these are um, strategies also that help the victim feel safer and that they have more agency. Um, so locks bedrooms, bathrooms, increasing supervision. Um, what that looks like is the perpetrator should not be left alone with any other um, children. Uh, they should not be babysitting. They should not be um, in a, it behind closed doors with their sibling at all. Um, they should have some adult supervision of them. Sometimes I've seen parents um, take the victim to sleep in their bedroom, right? Like, cause a lot of folks are living in small spaces. They're living in a one bedroom apartment with three children and a parent, you know? So how is that gonna work? So um, they're living in an RV, you know, five people in there. So how is that gonna work? So one way you can increase supervision um, is to have the, the victim sleep in with the parent, you know, uh, particularly if it's age appropriate, you know, if you have a five-year-old child and you're in a small space, that would make the most sense. Um, and, and then increasing supervision of the, of the perpetrating child, uh, making sure you know where they are, you know, what we know about um, people who perpetrate crimes, um, particularly sexual crimes against children, and particularly if it's a child who is going to go on to perpetrate outside his, outside his, her, their family, um, is that they are often seeking out positions uh, where they can have access to children, right? So thinking about where is this, where is this youth have access to children? Are they babysitting? Are they volunteering? Are they leading a youth group? Those kinds of things. So these are all questions you have to ask yourself and the parent needs to ask themselves about how do we keep children safe? Another reason that this is important is because um, once a parent becomes aware that there is sexual abuse occurring between siblings, um, particularly if child protective services becomes involved, then the parent is now held to a higher standard, right? Like the, when it first occurs and it's the parent is just learning of it, um, they now have an opportunity to change their environment, increase parenting skills, all of those things um, to reduce sexual abuse uh, of their victim child. However, if they deny it, if they say, well, it only happened because we were just so busy because I had to take three jobs because I lost my other job, um, and then the abuse happens again, it will be a bigger deal. Um, it will be a much bigger deal in terms of the the services that they're required to participate in. It may be a bigger deal in terms of any criminal prosecution that could happen. So it's really to the parent's benefit to make some of these changes um, and it will give them peace of mind too. So changes in bedrooms, where are the children sleeping? I just touched on that a little bit. Um, you can move children to sleep uh, in with the, with the adults, um, but it's, you know, it obviously, um, a child who is perpetrating sexual abuse against other children should not be sharing bedrooms with other children. That's that's just it. Um, and I would uh, go so far as to say, you know, if a parent is continuing to have um, children share bedrooms, one of whom is perpetrating sexual abuse on other children, um, that that in and of itself would be a, a call to Child Protective Services. That would be a report that a mandated reporter would need to make. Um, Maintaining privacy rules. So this, and this just goes along with good education about consent that we would want parents to be teaching children, um, that we're hoping other organizations that work with children are teaching them. Um, privacy, one person in the bathroom at a time. Uh, when you're changing clothes, you're the only person in the bedroom. Um, we don't walk around the house without, you know, pants or whatever that looks like, whatever the privacy rules are. Um, 
those are, you know, no one should be observing or around when another person doesn't have their clothes on is basically what it comes down to. And it's a good opportunity for parents to, you know, provide education as well. Um, those are good rules just in general in life. We're not, we should not be barging in on people in the bathroom. Uh, we shouldn't be walking around without clothes on in general. Those are general rules that we have in society. And so maintaining those in the home too um, helps model that. Door alarms, again, um, locks, door alarms are a good one, uh, baby monitors, internet monitoring is a really huge one. And it becomes more and more complicated every year as the internet and apps um, and technology uh, changes every year. But it's really important um, for parents to have internet monitoring, um, whatever that looks like. Maybe it's I check your cell phone, you know, every night your cell phone is off. Um, you know, between these hours, um, there's a variety of different, you know, parent uh, remote control apps that will send you a notification if your child is accessing um, certain sites that you don't want them to be watching. Um, and then it's also important to um, be conscientious, you know, if the siblings are still hanging out together, which happens, right? Like sexual abuse may happen between siblings and they still hang out and play games together and do things together. They probably shouldn't be watching um, internet together. Um, that's something that in particular a parent should monitor because it's very easy just to pull up some inappropriate website on your phone and have your sibling watching it with you and then switch it off when your parent watches, walks in the room. So I would say also no sharing of um, internet screen time. Um, only big screens that everyone can see. Um, another good internet monitoring rule is the internet is only used in public places. We don't, we're not on the internet in our bedroom. Um, we're not on the internet in the bathroom. We're on the internet in the living room where it's open access to everyone. Everyone can see what's happening. So internet monitoring is really, uh, is really key. Um, particularly because of the, um, just how desensitized uh, people have become and children are becoming to um, all of the sexual videos that are online. And then another really important thing is giving the victim agency to tell. And so what we want to do is really help the victim child develop language and knowing who the safe adults are to tell um, if sexual abuse continues to occur. Um, it's really important as you know, as I'm sure all of you know, that children know the, you know, the names of their body parts so that they're not um, calling it some sort of euphemism um, such as, you know, like a cookie or whatever. Parents come up with a variety of names to talk about our anatomical parts. <laughs> and uh, so giving a child the language, you know, so that they, if they tell someone, someone can understand. There's always the risk if they're not using the appropriate language that any adult that they tell is going to dismiss it. That happens. They, if, you know, we can only understand communication um, if we understand it, right? So I, so using appropriate terminology, helping parents um, to have those conversations with children um, about language. There's a lot of really great books out there. You know, it can be an awkward conversation for parents to have with their children. Um, so there's a lot of books, you know, they can just read a, a bedtime story about it. Um, good touch, bad touch, all those kinds of things. And then identifying safe adults. And this is something you might do with the child victim in particular. Because of all of the issues that are, um, that can be occurring in a family where sibling sexual abuse is happening, you know, the conflict that we talked about, um, substance use, domestic violence, any of those issues, the parent may not be the safest person to tell. Right. So helping the child identify who is a safe adult, a teacher, a school counselor, maybe they're in therapy, their own mental health counselor, um, someone at church, a grandparent, helping them come up with a list um, of just a couple of adults who they have access to. Right. It's not going to be any good if it's, um, you know, Uncle Joe, who you can barely get on a phone and it lives in um you know, New Zealand half the year. It should be someone that they have access to, that they're able to talk to, um, helping them 
uh, have that list of adults that they can reach out to if it's an older child, you know, who had because a lot of kids have cell phones, you know, by the age of nine or 10. So if it's a child that age, perhaps um, uh, want a chat line, a text line, but identifying someone safe that they can tell that is aside from their parent in the event that their parent is not a safe person to tell and then having that appropriate language. That is one of the biggest things that can be done to increase the safety of the victim um, is helping them connect with people who will believe them, who will listen to them and who will respond to them and giving them the ability to say it in such a manner that the adults that they've chosen to tell will understand what they're saying. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, otherwise, we're going to take a, a just a short five minute stretch water bathroom break and we'll come back at 226. Any, any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. You can also do that during the break. Uh, improving safety, the list that you had up there before um, it was a list of important pieces, but one of my, let's, we'll just say one of my clients, um, I'm trying to think how I want to explain this exactly. So they do have room options, but there is no door. Mm. How come? So there's no privacy for that room. What is the, how come they don't have doors? Um, they just didn't want them to have it. And so one person had called CPS and then came in and, and they said there was nothing they can do that they really should have a door. They listed some things that it wasn't safe, that sort of thing. But CPS didn't seem to investigate it. Hmm. Um, and it's happened a total of four times. So it's, uh, you know, because I see that they do, I see this on the list, some of these risk factors, but there was nothing put in place. That's unfortunate. Um, and unfortunately, there's an, I, I shouldn't say unfortunately, we have an idea in society that we're going to call child protective services and they're going to come in and make things better for the children, right? Um, and oftentimes CPS is very overloaded and overwhelmed. And so their goal is often to close cases. And so what needs to happen is, is um, they'll need to be called multiple times, right? Every instance um, an abuse is disclosed, they'll have to be called because the more times you call them, um, the more likely they are to respond. Uh, it's disappointing to me that they didn't at least um, require uh, doors on the bedroom. Um, that's very concerning to me. I definitely think that that's, I, I'd be curious to know more about the family dynamic where the family thinks it's okay that their child should not have a door on their bedroom. It sounds like privacy is not a big family value. Um, and so I would, want to work with the parents about that. What is developmentally normal? It's normal for children of a certain age to need privacy for themselves. Um, so working, working with them on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I know in the home area, um, there, there's just a lot of people and I think with my client, I'm trying to help out the client screaming and trying to get information, trying to get away. Um, but they continue to be put back into this home. It's incredibly frustrating. That is frustrating. So, you know, they're, they're coming in and they've set up, there's all these red flags. Um, I, like they're not allowed to touch food. They're... 
there's just all of I'm trying to think of some of the other things, but it, it's ex, they're extremely limited in what this child's allowed to do. And I just I don't know how to effectively get them out of this home or how to get messages to the child, how to help keep them safe. It's really difficult right now because a lot of children don't, you know, they're not in school, right? So they have safety and access to mandated reporting when they're in school. I'm curious if there is a way to collaborate with the school. A lot of, I mean, are they homeschooled or are they currently doing the Zoom school, you know, through their school district? They are doing the Zoom school. Um, but the parents continue to not collaborate with the school, they're not working with them, not working with the social worker, the teachers at the school are not getting involved, and so it's really Yeah, I'm not sure what happened to the other interpreter. She lost her internet, but we can go on. Okay, okay, thank you. Right, so as I was saying, oh, where was I? <laughs> so definitely, it seems that we there. she's just not being as collaborative. Those that we've reached out to are concerned, but they don't feel like there's anything they can do about it because of, uh, parental authority and such that they still hold. The best, the best that can be done is to continue to call child protective services just based on what has de been described to me. I hear a lot of concerning um, behaviors in the family. Uh, and so this is a family that I would be very concerned about that there would be ongoing sexual abuse of someone in the home. And actually this will, um, this will be a good segue into another question someone asked me, which is, um, have you seen in cases that you have worked in that young perpetrators have also been victimized themselves? Um, and I actually see, I see that less. And what I see more is that perpetrators who engage in this behavior against their siblings is because of the conflict in the home and the self-soothing property of engage sexual gratification, basically. Um, it's uh, it's a, a maladaptive coping mechanism. And so part of our work can also be honestly with the perpetrator, what are other things that you can do to manage distressing feelings? What else can you do? Um, and even if they're not saying, oh, I did this to my sibling or what have you, sometimes people engage or perpetrate against their siblings because um, it's, it's the only kind it releases endorphins. It's the only pleasure that they get, um, because the situation is so, um, stressful at home. So I haven't seen a lot of cases where the, the, uh, the perpetrator has been victimized. Uh, of course they could have been, and it just wasn't disclosed. I mean, that's definitely a possibility. Um, but I see it more in families where there's a lot of chaos, violence, and stability. And then do you have, the, the other question I got over the break was, do you have ideas? You're welcome, Natalie. Do you have ideas about how to help other siblings in the family when a sibling has been sexually abused? Um, and I am gonna talk about that because the reality is that um, when sex, just because sexual abuse is happening between two siblings, it impacts everyone. It impacts the whole family system. It impacts how the parents are reacting to it. And it also, um, some siblings, maybe they know something's going on and that it's not quite right. And in that way, you know, if they've walked in on their siblings, if they were, you know, perhaps the perpetrator tried to groom them um, and they wasn't gonna work with them, um, they are equally damaged. That's a form of sexual abuse against them as well. Uh, so it's, it's um, all of the strategies that I provide going forward will also be good for siblings who are, have not directly been uh, victimized by the perpetrator, but have been exposed to that environment. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit more um, about increasing safety. 
Uh, so of course, notifying, working with the authorities, CPS, the police, if that's, um, if they're involved. Um, one of the things that can be very helpful, one of the, the foundational um, principles that is protective against any sort of child abuse and neglect is attachment and having a healthy attachment to your child and for the child having a healthy attachment to their parent. And so um, one of the things that can really increase safety is increasing the attachment between the parent and child. Um, and that can look like uh, a lot of different things. It can be um, playing games together, you know, and not video games. I'm talking about board games, card games, um, go play basketball, things like that. Doing things pleasurable together helps strengthen attachment. Um, finding time to spend with each of the children individually. Um, that is a really difficult thing for a lot of families I work with. There just isn't time. You know, they have three kids and who has, you know, who feels like they have time to really spend, you know, a half an hour um, a week one-on-one -on -one with each child, but it's so important. It's so important for not only um, the child to feel attached to their parent, because when they're attached to their parent, they'll see their parent as someone who is safe and who can help protect them, making it more likely they will disclose. But it also is helpful for the parent. You know, sometimes kids are difficult. You know, sometimes some parents are more attached to some children than other children. And that that just happens. And so the parent also needs to feel really attached to their children in order to protect them. That's a really key thing. Um, and so finding that time to spend with the victim one-on-one, -on -one, the perpetrator one-on-one, -on -one, the siblings one-on-one, -on -one, that can be very important for attachment, playing games, doing art projects. I mentioned those, um, those two, the games and the art projects, because uh, both of those are demonstrated to raise oxytocin, uh, which helps increase attachment. Oxytocin is that wonderful chemical that um, helps with bonding. So those two things can be helpful. Giving parents skills to manage traumatic reactions, um, helping parents uh, manage their own distressing feelings. This is really important because children learn how to handle their feelings by watching their parents. And if a parent is not able to be there for their child emotionally because they're too distressed, they're depressed, they're angry, all of those things, that is going to make the environment less safe for the child because the parent will be checked out and caught up in their own feelings. They can't be as present. And then education, just some of the stuff that I talked about earlier about how common it is. Um, education on how, what they can do, what can the parent do to make things better. Uh, you know, when a child discloses that they've been sexually abused, it really throws um, kind of a parent's worldview uh, into question. You know, um, it changes your ideas of what was safe. It changes, you know, some parents, they feel like they did a really bad job. They must be a bad parent. So providing education, not only on common reactions that the parent might have, but also that the siblings may have. Um, education on what makes things safer for victims and then safer for perpetrators as well. Education on what the resources are, what groups are out there. Um, is the perpetrator a child that needs, you know, to? to have an at-risk youth petition? Are there other risk factors? Um, is this the first time the, the parent is recognizing that being uh, involved in a relationship where domestic violence is present has lessened their ability to keep their kids safe? You know, there are other issues within sibling sexual abuse that are probably occurring in the family that the parent is gonna need some education about to help them make better choices. So when kids are coming to work with you, um, oh, and you know, parents too, a lot of them, they talk, I want coping skills. I want my child to have coping skills. I want them to feel better. And one of the challenges for, um, for sibling sexual abuse is that often the, the abuser and the perpetrator, or the a victim and the abuser have to continue living together. It's not, it's not like domestic violence where they could break up and live in different households. You know, that's, that's whoever, 
is responsible for the child, um, they're responsible for all their children, whether it's the victim or the perpetrator. Um, and so it can be really difficult to manage feelings in that situation because you may not, you know, the child may not feel safe. Um, so here are some different techniques uh, for helping manage emotions. We're gonna go over those for the next couple of slides. Um, and there's a handout for this, which I can send to Michelle as well. Um, this is a finger holds for anxiety. I don't know if anyone here has heard of this, but it's something really easy to do. Um, and also, I think it's really important to give kids tools that they can do anywhere, right? Because maybe they're at school in the middle of their math lesson and all of a sudden they're having a whole bunch of stuff come up and they don't wanna you know, bring attention to themselves or they can't leave the class, you know, maybe it's a strict teacher and they're not allowed to get a bathroom pass to go deal with this. So this one is one that is um, simple and easy to do. And it's also based on energy meridians um, in our body. So there's some scientific um, kind of background to it. So finger holds for anxiety. I have put up, there's different language for adults. It works for kids and adults, but it's the same feelings, right? So your thumb is upset. Your finger, your forefinger is scared. Your middle finger is mad. Your ring finger is worried. And then your pinky finger is just feeling bad, unsettled. And so the thought is, is that you choose the finger that represents the emotions that you're most feeling. And you can also do all the fingers. It just depends on what you wanna do. But let's say we're feeling upset. So I wanna practice this a little bit. We're gonna take two minutes to practice. And so what you do is you'll, you'll hold, you'll take your, it can be either hand, you can do it on both hands, it doesn't matter. So you're gonna take your hand, we're gonna choose, or you can choose whatever finger you want. I'm gonna choose my thumb for upset and you're just gonna hold it and you're gonna hold it somewhere between two and five minutes. We'll do it for two minutes. I've got my timer up and you're just gonna breathe. And it's a gentle pressure you're holding and you breathe. Children often need this um, for less time. Children often need between 30 seconds and a minute. Adults usually need two to five minutes. Bigger hands, bigger problems. We've got about a minute left. And whatever finger you've chosen, just think about whatever the things that are making you feel that way and breathe them out. Okay, come back. Find your feet grounding is good. I like that one too. It's really about, you know, coming into your body in a certain way. This particular, the finger holds does have, you know, the meridians, but finding your feet, your feet on the ground um, is a really good one. Um, the other reason I like this is because it's really easy for a parent to model without having to do a lot of active listening, without having to really get at the root of the problem. A parent usually can be, okay, I can see that she is feeling scared. And let's spend, you know, let's spend the next minute holding onto your finger, you know, and it's so it, it's helpful for the parent. 
to model. Um, they can direct it. They can see that their child is feeling a certain type of way and say, let's do this. And they can also observe if the child just does this on their own and respond to that. You know, maybe the child is holding the worried finger. The parent can notice that they're doing that. And that's a clue for the parent that, you know, this child is, is struggling right now. So without even using words, the child is able to communicate how they're feeling and the parent is able to observe that. And that can be really um, good. So the emotion management box, um, this is a great one. You can see there, sometimes it's really helpful. Even myself as an adult, I do a variation of this. It's not a box, but it's a calendar. So um, a worry box, and this is good for the victim. And then of course, all of, if there are other siblings in the home, non-offending siblings, they are victims too. And this can, that the finger hold that we just did, as well as this, uh, um, the worry box is another activity that, you know, everyone in the home can do, including the perpetrator if they need to. Um, so decorate a box with the child, uh, doing a collage, coloring it, glitter, whatever, something that makes, um, is visually pleasing to the child that they have directed. Um, and you write the word worry on it, you know, or problems or whatever, however the child, it should be child language, however they describe what the bad things in their mind that they don't wanna think about, the things that are affecting them. Um, and so what you can do is you, you decorate this box, you explain that the box is gonna hold the worries that you don't wanna focus on right now. Um, and so you can come back to those worries or you know this is just an exercise kind of to distract yourself from those worries. So you write the worry down, you fold it up, put it in the box. And that also helps the child feel more in control of their thoughts and their anxiety. Now, one of the things you can do is you can ask the child if it's okay if their parent sometimes checks in on their worry box. Perhaps you have a really great supportive parent. Um, you're not seeing any uh, red flags for other issues in the home. The parent is really responding well. Uh, this may be an opportunity, another way for the child to communicate with the parent the thoughts or things they're feeling. Of course, the child may say no. I don't want you to tell my mom. I don't want you to tell my dad. These are private thoughts. Um, and so in that case, that should be respected too. You know, and you can do a variety of things to make it so the child, you know, perhaps they're a really private child. You know, you can tape it up real good so no one can get in there. Whatever's gonna help them feel secure. Um, and so this practice, like for myself as an adult, um, if I have things that I am worried about, you know, over projects, assignments, a bill, something, I write it on my calendar, and I can't do anything about it today, I write it on my calendar for a different day to worry about, you know, I'm going to worry about this project that's due on December 7th, that will be my day to worry about it and make a plan about it. So it's kind of putting, you know, because sometimes worries, um, they're not necessarily things we need to process. They're just things that are nagging at us. You know, Is it helpful for the child to worry throughout school, throughout their whole day about whatever's bothering them? Usually it's not, you know? Usually it's not because we don't have a lot of control over anything other than ourselves. So a worry box. And then of course, breathing exercises. We did a little bit with the, with the finger holds. Breathing exercises are another one that kids can do anywhere, which I think is really important um, because you know they can be anywhere. You know, Maybe they're at the doctor's office waiting. Maybe they're at the grocery store with their dad. So breathing exercises is, is another one. And there's so many um, different versions of breathing exercises. Um, Depending on the developmental age of the child, there's different ones um, that may be more relevant, right? Like if a child can't count yet, it's not, maybe not helpful to do um, a counting exercise where you're counting for four, you know, breathing in, holding for four, those kinds of things. Um, you can do a different one or you, you know, the child just you maybe want to make it entertaining for the child. So another one um, that I like to do with kids is using your breath to blow bubbles. You know, particularly if you have bubbles and you have, you have to breathe in and then blow out, really control your breath in order to blow a huge bubble. Right. And so that can be another way to help them get into regulating with their breath in a way that's more entertaining for children. Um, 
you can also do it with balloons. Um, you can blow up balloons and label them feelings and pop them. You know, I'm feeling scared and you can blow all your scary feelings into the balloon and pop them. Or I'm feeling mad, you know, any of those things. That can be a good externalizing one too. Um, and it's also a good activity to do with the parent and the child um, together, right? Like it's good for the parent to do, to also practice some of this deep breathing stuff. Um, it's good for the other siblings in the home to do it, um, to practice the breathing, whether that be through a counted method, a specific exercise, or with, you know, bubbles and balloons or, you know, other things that they blow into. Okay. So that is all I have for today. Does anyone have questions or reactions or things that they want to bring up with? We have just a few minutes left of our time together. So you can put stuff in the chat and I'm happy to read it or you can raise your hand and ask to be unmuted. You're all very welcome. Good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad other people will get to see this too. And I want to I want to thank you all for doing the hard work um, that you're doing on behalf of children and on behalf of families. You know, that's really important work. Our childhoods really lay the foundation for the rest of our lives. So thank you for being there for them.